This episode of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Closed Loop Partners. Closed Loop Partners is a leading circular economy investor in the United States with an extensive network of Fortune 500 corporate investors, family offices, institutional investors, industry experts, and impact partners. Closed Loop's platform spans the arc of capital from venture capital to private equity, bridging gaps, and fostering synergies to scale the circular economy. To find Closed Loop Partners, please go to www.closedlooppartners.com. Hi, this is John Shigarian. I never could have imagined when we started the Green is Good radio show back in 2006 that it would grow into a big podcast called the Green is Good podcast. And now we've evolved that podcast to the Impact Podcast, which is more inclusive and more diverse than ever before. But we did look back recently at some of our timeless Green is Good interviews and decided to share some of them with you now. So enjoy one of our great Green is Good episodes from our archives. And next week, I'll be back with a fresh and new episode of the Impact Podcast. Thanks again for listening. I'm grateful to all of you. This is John Shigarian. Welcome to Green is Good, raising awareness of each individual's impact on the environment and helping to create a more beautiful and sustainable world. Now, here's John Shigarian, Chairman and CEO of Electronic Recyclers International and Mike Brady. Welcome to Green is Good. And Mike, it's so great to be in studio with you here today. Always a pleasure, John. And springtime in the Valley, boy, just doesn't get any better than this, does it? This is a great time of year to be alive in the Central Valley of California. You know, I just wonder if springtime makes us a whole lot more appreciative of the world around us. You know, we've been through a winter, and of course, our winters here are nothing like other parts of the country or other parts of the world. But uh, just to see nature in a whole new way, I mean, with the greening of everything around us, makes us really think, what a beautiful planet. It is really, it is. And and this is such a green time of year here, which is, uh, it's so much fun. We still are the ag belt of the United States, if not the world. And most people don't even realize that, that this is the number one place in the world for raisins and for garlic and for so many other agricultural products. I think cotton and tomatoes, too, were right in the top one, two, or three. You're absolutely correct. Uh, here in the Central Valley, we got plenty of sunshine. All we need is the water. Yeah, and actually, cotton, I'm sure, is going to come up in some of our discussions today because, Mike, part of our discussions today are going to be around clothing and shoes. And I don't know much about organic clothing. I don't know much about the shoe and the shoe movement when it comes to the greening and sustainability movement. But we're going to learn a lot today. And, you know, I have worn once or twice an organic, quote unquote, organic T-shirt. And I'll tell you, it, it is a, a lot better feeling than just a regular old tee, which I'm just used to just wonderful old t-shirts. Well, you know, I never even thought about that. Think about <laughs> organic when we go grocery shopping and all of that right. stuff, and we're using pesticides or whatever, try and be as, as earth-friendly as possible. Yeah. But I never really thought about an organic t-shirt. So a lot of what we're doing today is is we're going to be talking about those issues, which goes back to here in the Valley, There there is a lot of organic uh, food being planted now and a lot of organic uh, products being grown here. I, I ran into a guy recently and he told me he was growing, he just planted thousands of acres of organic olives and he said that's the next big thing. Hmm. Interesting. So, so I mean, uh, the Valley's uh, not only uh, the ag belt of the world, but uh, but I think uh, has a, a bunch of uh, new new age, uh, new new cutting sustainability uh, products on on the way here. Well, you know what I'm thinking. I just what? had a, just a weird visual. Of What's a, that? You know, a dad and a mom just driving with the kids in the back seat, <laughs> heading down 99, and pointing to a cotton field. Say, you know what they're growing over there, kids? T-shirts. <laughs> we don't think in those terms. We don't, but I think soon soon to be, soon to be. And that's the fun part about what we do because we get to share that word a little bit. Well, very good. So let's uh, line out the show today. Who we got for guest yeah. number one? Yeah, guest number one, we have Marcy Zaroff, and Marcy's going to be talking about what she's doing uh, in the in the eco fashion world with regards to organic, sustainable clothing. And on the back side of our show today, we have uh, an amazing brand. We have uh, Timberland today. Timberland Shoes on, on the show with us. So it's it's just going to be another one of these great shows of that talking about things that not necessarily usually cross our desk. Okay, so fashionistas, you have been alerted. Stick around. It's going to be a great hour. 
Come on back for more Green is Good. If a little green is good, more is even better. Now, back to Green is Good with John Shigarian and Mike Brady. Welcome back to Green is Good, and we're so excited to have Marcy Zaroff on the show today. She's calling in from Florida, and Marcy is... I, if I, we, we kill the whole show if we just spoke about her biography. Marcy's the founder and former CEO, president of Under the Canopy, and she's currently launching Face, F A S E. You could go see that on Facebook, Fashion, Art, Soul, and Earth. And she coined the term and pioneered the market for Echo Fashion. How cool is that? Marcy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So we've never had someone like you, as as uh, uh, Mike said in our intro earlier, a fashionista in the green revolution who fused style and sustainability. Marcy, what is this? What's going on and what are you doing? Well, um, eco-fashion, when I started this, this whole concept and building this market, it was somewhat paradoxical. People used to look at me like I was insane, you know, because those concepts of ecology and fashion are, you know, are, are quite the opposite historically. But my goal was to fuse those worlds together and to show people who live consciously and mindfully that you can be fashion forward and also be responsible to the planet and to show people that are in the fashion world uh, that, you know, they can actually buy product that is stylish and high quality and, and fits well and the right colors and on trend, but, but be mindful. So it's... Uh, you know, it's a new market that I believe is really the future of fashion now. Okay, so wait a second. You had this idea, but what was, what changed? I mean, what was your inspiration? Where was your epiphany? <laughs> um, well, I've always been a fashion consumer. I kind of joke that my, you know, my background is that I got best dressed in high school. So it was one <laughs> of those, um, you know, one of those things that just naturally I was the one everyone wanted to take shopping growing up. But um, I, when I got a business degree, I actually started a school in New York that today is called the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. So wow. I, my background is that I started on the food and beauty side, and it dawned on me um, after a decade in that world of you know organic and natural food and beauty that there was a missing link in that whole wellness equation and that you couldn't really support food without supporting fiber right. because the whole premise of organic agriculture is the interconnection in nature and building soil and crop rotation and all these different ways to actually protect and build soil to to build a uh, a stronger plan. And so therefore, when I started to learn about that and I started to marry that with my, my passion for fashion, I saw that there was a market opportunity that that consumer who is buying and thinking more consciously would eventually evolve into. Well, so, you know, I understand fashion, art, soul, and earth face, which is on Facebook for our listeners out there. So explain when you, what happened in 96 that you started under the canopy and what did that mean then? <laughs> well, my original goal was to revolutionize the fashion world okay. and to demonstrate that, again, style and, and color and quality are not mutually exclusive with social and environmental responsibility. But right. when you look back on the history of organic clothing, yeah. um, for s- simplistic standpoint, yeah. it was once, you know, that kind of frumpy, boxy, boring, beige, overpriced, hempy, you know, potato sack type of um, stigma that when people would think of organic clothing, that's what they would think. And what I really wanted to do was drive the market from hippie to hip and to, to make fashion or clothing that people wanted to wear, that people wanted to buy, and that ultimately made them not only look good but feel good inside. So you were – yeah, okay, so okay, keep going. I'm sorry. No, no. So under the canopy, the whole premise is that we all live under the canopy of the planet's ecosystem together. Ah. The brand was launched in 1996 after I coined the term eco-fashion to become the pioneering brand to start telling that story and educating the consumer and then simultaneously working with farmers and factories worldwide, getting in the trenches and helping connect those dots to create and develop products that people would buy simply because they're, it's great product. And, oh, by the way, it's also organic. And sort of shock people to, to, you know, to recognize that it's not about why would I buy organic, it's why wouldn't you buy organic. You know, that's really brilliant, Marcy, because you, you do it exactly right. And it's kind of like uh, working backwards a little bit when the, when the goal is really all about, uh, you know, better ecological living. But, you know, like you said early, 
people think about the eco fashion, the first thing you think, oh, okay, if it's ecologically sound, it's probably hippie and doesn't look that good. But to get something that really catches somebody's eye, especially somebody with a real sense of fashion, which you obviously have, you're in the right place and doing exactly the right thing, to just be able to hook them on the back end and say, oh, yeah, by the way, you're doing something really good, not only for the planet, but for your kids and grandkids. That's brilliant. Well, it's, it's an important industry, and I think a lot of people don't realize how important it really is because, you know, the apparel and textile industry is one of the most toxic industries in the world. And conventional cotton, as an example, most people think is is natural or they even think it's organic right. um, because that's what they've been told. Right. But when you pull the curtain back on just regular cotton, regular cotton that's not organic is actually one of the world's leading causes of air and water pollution. Wow. And it is it is the most heavily sprayed industry in the world. So cotton represents, as an example, less than 3% of the world's agriculture, but uses over 25% of the most harmful insecticides and the most toxic pesticides so, that are out there. So when you started this movement, obviously you're a pioneer in this whole eco-fashion world. Back in 96, this was before anyone knew that the Green Revolution was here to stay. Obviously, you did. You 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 pioneered this. How was that evolution? Explain to our listeners and to Mike and I, 96 to through 2010, I know we crossed over. You won many awards along the way, but we've crossed over somewhere, you know, in this whole climate change issue and the political will is there now and Al Gore is, a, a, you know, a green rock star. So the Green Revolution now people know is here to stay, but how was that climb up the hill, Marcy, from 96 to now? Well, it wasn't easy, so if any t- anybody tells me I got lucky, I get to, you know, <laughs> slap them in the face a few times. Right? <laughs> it's been a, a very exciting journey, and, okay. you know, a lot of it has been grounded in education and sure. getting out there and talking about, you know, the solution to, you know, to the negative ramifications of the textile world and to demonstrate that, you know, currently that industry, you know, um, contributes to the destruction of soil and and the destruction of ecosystems and pollutes the water that we depend on and the air that we breathe. And so it's a matter of shifting the paradigm yep. and, and, again, giving people product that they actually want to buy and wear and, you know, that ultimately, you know, the kind of product people want to, to support – simply because it's great product. And what was happening, what what I was finding is that when you plant the seed of, say, consciousness into a consumer, you know, who might be now shopping at Whole Foods and buying organic food or, you know, looking into eco-travel or, you know, being mindful about climate change issues or for whatever way, however the consumer is, is learning about, you know, that how their choices can actually make a difference in the world. Sure. You know, that seed gets cultivated where the, that person typically says, well, what else? What's next? What more? You know, it's that evolution. And so what I found back in the 90s was, you know, in the early years of the organic food and beauty movement was that people were asking that question. And when you look at the two basic necessities that everybody has to buy out there today, it's apparel and food, right? Right. We all wear clothing. Right, right. And uh, it made sense that, you know, that especially with the interconnection in nature, and a lot of people don't realize this either, but 60% of a cotton plant ends up into our food stream. So in the form of cotton seed and cotton oil for uh, feed for dairy, for snack foods. So actually cotton is going into our food in addition to being on our bodies. Wow. Right? And when you think about how much cotton is in everybody's wardrobe between the clothing you're wearing and the sheets you're sleeping on and the towels and robes you're using in the bathroom, Mm -hmm. you know, you have it against your skin um, pretty much all day long and all night long. And, you know, our skin is the largest organ in our body and our primary organ for absorption. So it's not just about what you eat. Sure. It's about what you wear. So now now that the world is really catching up with your vision— I mean, really, I mean, the Green Revolution's here to stay. We've gone, we've passed that tipping point. What's next for you? Like, how are you going to now take everything you've learned and done the last 14 years and make it into that your next great thing? What's happening? What's in the pipeline for you and the whole apparel, fashion, sustainability movement? 
Well, what's really exciting is that what was once, you know, a very niche idea has now um, shifted gears in the apparel world, where I work with a lot of major retailers. I've launched organic programs for a lot of the major, major retailers out there, and it's no longer about staying ahead. It's about not being left behind. And so I'm seeing factories and worldwide and retailers jumping on this bandwagon where there's now a um, a, a platform to get product out into the market. And my focus has been on building a retail uh, store chain that is called Face oh. that's going to be vertically integrated and where I believe we're going to be very groundbreaking in the market for this whole concept of eco-fashion is we're going to be bringing the first wearable and affordable sustainable fashion to the marketplace. So we're going to break the stigma that you have to pay more for organic clothing. We're going to break the stigma that it's not stylish. Um, And we're going to give people product that looks great, feels great, and, oh, by the way, it's organic. And it's less expensive than the conventional counterparts because we're vertically integrated working with farmers because all these years that I've built the market – I've built farm projects, and I've worked on such a ground floor level that we can pass that value now to the consumer and, again, and give the consumer now that choice that, that is kind of a win-win for, for all the players. So, our listeners, yeah. so for our listeners who want to buy now are getting excited and want to buy the affordable eco-fashion that you're going to be creating, where are the stores going to open, where can they buy, buy these products, uh, and, and explain what's when and where. Okay, so FACE is going to be launching this fall. Uh, We're going to be opening our flagship retail location in Santa Monica, California. Uh, We're going to have a lifestyle lounge in the stores. We're going to have mostly women's wear, a little bit of men's wear that we're calling What's-His-Face, a little bit of baby baby (laughs) wear that's called Baby Face, some Uh. home products called Home Face, and then some sort of underwear that's called Inner Face. It's going to be a really fun brand, um, very engaging, and we're going to open our second store in New York City in October, and then we're going to roll out nationwide from there. And wow. in addition, for all those who don't live in those cities, we're going to have a state-of-the-art e-commerce website that will be launched in September. Good and for you. Uh, in the you know between now and then, um, as you said earlier, if people go on our Facebook page um, sure. and sign up to be on the Face F A S E fan page, then we'll keep them abreast of, of all these openings and that launches. Is, that is just amazing. So you've worked, you're saying, from the, from, from the beginning, from growing all the way to working with the retailers. So you really know the whole cycle and you understand every element and every step along the way. Exactly. I mean, the, the goal for me has been to offer farm to finished fashion that we can pass that value to the consumer where, you know, in, at the end of the day, buying great apparel, they're getting value and values. And, and are, are you going to be working with any specific designers or do you have your own design team or how does that work when we've never had as a guest someone from the apparel industry talking about these issues? Explain, you know, where your product is. Is the product going to be domestically grown or are the best farms in different parts of the world? How does this work? Well, most of our cotton is coming out of India, um, where a lot of people don't realize this, but every half an hour, a conventional cotton farmer is committing suicide because of the whole, what we call the pesticide treadmill, where there's a paradigm that's just not working, and they're ending up, um, the farmers are ending up leveraging their farms to the pesticide companies and the banks in order to afford the pesticides, which ultimately are weakening their soil at their plants and ultimately um, creating a, a model that doesn't, doesn't work. And wow. so we're really excited to help the farmers. We're, we're excited, and, and that's probably one of my favorite things that I do is when I go over to India and I'm working in the farms. Um, but we're, we're really excited about giving people product that's not only made from organic cotton, but it's also made from other innovative fabrics like uh, eucalyptus is a new fiber we're going to be bringing to the market with the face brand. And eucalyptus is made from eucalyptus. And where does that come from? Um, the eucalyptus is actually grown on managed tree farms in South Africa wow. and is manufactured and broken down using a non-toxic recycled detergent. It's completely chemical-free, and it's manufactured in a closed-loop system. 
And of course, the eucalyptus is grown without any pesticides or chemicals and, and minimal water because eucalyptus grows very quickly. Right. So it's another really great eco-friendly fiber. Um, we're going to be offering in our line organic cashmere, organic denim, organic leather, organic silk, um, as well as organic cotton all different types of fabrics from voile to French terry to jersey, um, just so there's a, a, a very uh, deep and wide array of fabrications and designs for people to enjoy. And it's, um, it's going to be a really exciting collection. Marcy, we are just totally blown away. We're blown I mean, away. We're sitting here with our, our jaws really <laughs> on this uh, studio console. But when you mention organic leather, what, uh, what's the story behind yeah. organic leather? Well, if you think about free-range chicken or free-range beef, it's a right. similar concept. Okay. Wow. The, um, the, the animals are being treated humanely. They're grazing on, on natural, uh, natural feeds uh, or grass. They're not being injected with hormones and antibiotics and steroids. Um, and, and there's actually be, I'm, I happen to be a vegetarian, but okay. there is, uh, you know, there are people that want free range meat and, um, by all means, you know, when you look at leather as a byproduct of the meat industry for those who are eating, you know, organic meat, um, it's a question of, again, about the environment. Um, you know, is that, is that going to go back into the environment or used, um, as a byproduct for another industry? Now I'm, you know, for those people who are vegan and don't want, you know, in our line to see your know, organic leather or silk or wool or cashmere, we have plenty of options like eucalyptus and all the different blends of organic cotton fabrics that we're going to be working with. Um, so there's plenty of choice for everyone. Well, it sure seems to make a whole lot of sense because really uh, it is it is coming full circle and that there is no waste because obviously not everybody is going to become a vegetarian before life on this planet is through. So for those who choose to uh, eat meat or continue eating meat, this makes an awful lot of sense. This is is the one of the most sane pro, uh, propositions I've ever heard in my life. This this just makes so much sense, Marcy. Plus, plus the leather um, that we use is formaldehyde free. It's vegetable tanned. So you know we go beyond the fibers themselves, and, and that's the case in all of our um, fabrics and our cottons and everything. We use only low impact dyes. So there's no heavy metals, there's no formaldehyde, um, there's no uh, bleaches. So, you know, we look at not just the fibers, we look at the manufacturing processes. We're supporting fair trade. I'm helping Transfair right now actually launch the first USA certified fair fair trade textile um, program for the United States, and that's going to be coming out later this year as well. So I'm really excited about that. Um, where we're going to be making sure that farmers and factory workers, um, cotton farmers and factory workers in uh, India specifically, but ultimately worldwide, uh, are being paid fair prices and being treated with fair working conditions, and it's a, it's a really exciting program. You know, this reminds Mike and I. Mike and I had the head of the Rainforest Alliance on. He called in from Costa Rica, and what you're doing in eco-fashion, he, obviously Rainforest Alliance does that in the food industry. So it's fascinating what, what, what you're doing. Now, this, this is a massive, massive venture, though. Are you backed, or do you have a lot of partners that you're allowed to talk about? I mean, how are you putting this all together? This sounds like, wow. Well, I have a phenomenal management team. They're all rock stars out of the <laughs> apparel world and e-commerce world. I've got um, investor groups that have come on board that are um, – just really wonderful strategic partners. We've got a lot of celebrities involved. We have... Um, Any of them you're allowed to talk about? <laughs> um, well, we've got, um, you know, pretty strong friendships with um, a number of celebrities. So one of our uh, advisors is Rosanna Arquette, a very dear friend. Wow. Um, we have people like Alicia Silverstone and Amy Smart and Anna Getty that are, are uh, fans um, of our products. Um, we have been starting to plant the seed and introduce the product into the market very slowly from the sample lines that we have. And sure. we're seeing just an exciting response from women of all ages, really from teenagers to women in their 20s, 30s, and 40s to the moms of the teenagers in their 40s and 50s. Um, and everybody is really responding extremely well to the product. I'm also working with um, James Cameron's wife, Susie Cameron, on um, a whole initiative, we're calling ourselves the Eco Chic Warriors, 
and the goal is to green the fashion industry, and I'm on a board that Susie actually founded. Wait a second, though. You just mentioned all beautiful women. I mean, where's the guys in this whole equation? What's going on, <laughs> Well, you know, that's the, fun, that's the fun of the brand, that you got to have some what's-his-face for what's-his-face, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> for regular guys, right? <laughs> yes, there will be some wonderful men's uh, menswear in the line as well. Just coming out of the gate, it's going to be more limited, but over time we will grow Good that part for of the you. brand. Good for you. So you really are truly, when they, people say up in the air, you're up in the air because you're down in India. Uh, I assume you're also, since you're doing the, the, the eucalyptus, you're in, you're, you go to Africa, so you're, you're on the road a lot. I do a lot of traveling, and, um, you know, again, it's been um, a very uh, long journey, but an exciting one. I'm very passionate about this marketplace, and I think we're at the tipping point right now of seeing uh, this whole market really take off. Um, there's all kinds of efforts going on beyond even the, the, the Eco Chic Warrior Group. There's the NRDC has launched um, a, a whole initiative called Cleaner by Design, which is going after the whole um, fashion world uh, on the very, very big level of, you know, the Nikes of the world and and looking at, you know, how they can be more engaged in shifting paradigms. And we're just seeing a lot of players globally that are, are now getting involved. And I've definitely uh, been in the trenches and, and I've had a great time working with just such a wide array of people from the supply chain, as well as on the retail side. Marcy, we're down to the last minute or so, but do you have any uh, you know, last words of wisdom for uh, budding entrepreneurs or other visionaries out there that sometimes the mountain looks too high, obviously, which you're, you're I mean, do you, do you have any last words you want to share with our listeners? Well, you know, I've, I've always sort of subscribed to the, the, you know, vision is the art of seeing things invisible. It's one of my favorite quotes by Jonathan Swift. And, you know, to stay true to what you believe and to follow your heart and visualize the future, to be, you know, proactive and not reactive, and um, to be authentic and, uh, and transparent, because I think those are all key parts of, you know, the whole green movement as well, and to... Um, you know, to look at how to take one step at a time, because it can be kind of daunting entering this arena, um, but the journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. <laughs> well, Marcy, about two, one step. we're, we're going to have, Mike and I are so thrilled at what you're doing, and we're so honored to have you on today, and we're going to have you back after your stores start to open and your online uh, shop is up online. You know, for all our listeners out there, you could go to Marcy's uh, face Facebook page, F A S E. It's amazing and wonderful. And and Marcy, we wish you all the luck opening up in Santa Monica, New York City, and getting your online retail store going. And for all the amazing work you've doing and everything you've dreamed up since 1996. And we wish you all the luck in the world. And Marcy Zaroff, you are truly living proof that green is good. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me today. If a little green is good, more is even better. Now, back to Green is Good with John Shigarian and Mike Brady. Welcome back to Green is Good. Mike, who knew that you and I could be walking around in our Fonzie-esque leather jackets that are made out of organic leather? How about that? Huh? Organic leather, I still like that. That whole concept just you know, kind of boggles the mind. But I really, I really liked when we were talking to Marcy just about the confluence of fashion and the environment all together. And, what did, you call, and what did you call her? Well, she's a, she is a fashionista. I she, love that. She's an environista. I environista. Think. I love yeah, it. That's yeah. even better. So, uh, no, no. So, you know, that was a great sp- a whole show on clothing and the, and the sustainability movement with regards to clothing and organic clothing. But not only, you know, she also took us through the whole uh, product chain, the, the whole, you know, how, where it's even grown and how it's grown and the importance of where it's grown, how it's grown and the people, how they're being treated, who's growing it. So it's, it's much more deep than just pulling uh, something off a rack. Yeah. And the other takeaway f- for it too, John, I, I thought when she made such a great point, Marcy did when she's talking about the biggest organ on our body oh, great po- is our skin and how much of our body touches clothing. Great call, Mike. That's right. So it really makes so much sense. So that really was a fascinating first half hour. And if you like that, boy, are you going to love the second half? Well, we got Betsy Blaisdell on, who's the senior management in charge, uh, senior ma- senior manager in charge of environmental stewardship. 
for the great Timberland Company, which we're going from we're going from clothing to shoes, and uh, and and Timberland's been a very green company for a long time. But Betsy's another green rock star, just like uh, Marcy, and it's a perfect bookend to this hour today, Mike, because Betsy's going to talk us uh, talk to us about all the great things Timberland's doing in the in the in the climate change area, but also with our own products and also with our own stores. So I think everyone should come on back and hear. Betsy talk about Timberland at Green is Good. If a little green is good, more is even better. Now, back to Green is Good with John Shigarian and Mike Brady. Welcome back to Green is Good, and we're so honored and excited today to have Betsy Blaisdell on. She's the Senior Manager of Environmental Stewardship for the Great Timberland Company, which is in New Hampshire. And Betsy, your focus is on environmental stewardship what does that mean? And welcome to Green is Good, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Thanks very much. Uh, my, my title in environmental stewardship means I oversee our company's environmental footprint around yeah. the globe. Okay. So I, I measure what our environmental impact is as a company, and I work to reduce it. Okay, so around the globe. You're sitting in New Hampshire. What does around the globe mean for Timberland? Where, how many places do you have around the world that you have to tie together? We have operations in more than 20 countries. Wow. We sell our product around the world. So we're in Europe, we're in Asia, and I and we have factories that are based all over the world, too. So I'm looking at both our facilities in all those countries, um, communicating with consumers in all those countries, and then also uh, the countries where our factory sources were actively engaged in in um, working with our factories on improving environmental standards. So wait a second. You're really, I mean, talk about a, a huge position and such a critical position. You're helping in terms of uh, the, the product control and how it's manufactured. Then you're also internally the stewardship issues in terms of getting the employees on board with this and motivating them to be part of this, and then also messaging to the consumers? Exactly. Wow. Okay, so tell us a little bit about, so let's, let's go through all three of those. Let's talk about the manufacturing side and reducing waste and, and making, and the process, and the process of making Timberland uh, a more sustainable company from a manufacturing and design perspective. Sure. So I think on the manufacturing and where we have the most impact yep. is making better decisions at the front end. So where we design and develop our product work with those teams to give them good environmental information so they can make better choices. It's a lot easier to design a product and assign materials to it that have a smaller environmental impact than to go to our factories and unfairly say, hey, you guys need to figure out. You need to figure out how to make your uh, your emissions less. You need to figure out how to use less water. It's, it's far more effective if we work on the front end. So that's really the focus of our initiatives. Okay. To provide good information to the folks designing and developing our, okay. our product. And then your employees, how do you get them to, 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 to enjoy and, 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 and be, make the green DNA of Timberland part of what they do inside the company and also outside of the company? Well, let's just say it's not a very hard job. And if you were in the Timberland building right now, you'd kind of get it. We've got this great outdoor culture because we're in the outdoor industry. So I think the connection for our employees, it's, it's somewhat explicit. You, okay. know, you work in the outdoor industry. You care about the outdoors. We recreate outdoors. We're designing products for consumers who love the outdoors, so it's, it's fairly Im- implicit. Great, and then when you're tying together the, the what sounds like a daunting position of tying together 20 or so operations around the world, do you have point people or point teams that are sharing best practices and inspiring one another in terms of things they're discovering or things that they're coming up with among all your facilities around the world? We do. We have global stewards, and those are employees that apply to have Two years of time where they get written into their expectations specific corporate social responsibility responsibilities. Wow. And those employees really act as ambassadors for all of our corporate social responsibility initiatives, which include, you know, both environmental and community service initiatives. Wow. So then so then you you're you're the glue that brings all of them together and gets the information shared among all of them and throughout the all the uh, upper management of the company, then I take it. Yeah, we have a great team here in New Hampshire that helps manage it. 
So it's not just me, but a group of really enthusiastic people. So now that, now we come up then to the big question of, of your consumers. And how do you know that, the, that, that your wonderful consumers who love your great products can understand all that you're doing to ensure that your products are designed, manufactured, and that green is really part of the real DNA of Timberland? How do you message that to the consumers? Well, we're a little kooky. We're sort of inspired by nutrition labels that are on cereal boxes. So our way of communicating is providing the information about the impacts, the good and the bad associated with our product, right on our product, in a on a label that looks just like a nutrition label on your cereal box. And so consumers can see when they check out a Timberland shoe at a store what some of the environmental impacts are associated with both our business and product. Or if they're shopping in our store, they can see the changes we've made to our storefront that make them uh, LEED certified, which is a green building certification. Wow. Or they can go on our website and see um, at earthkeeper.com how uh, individuals can become earthkeepers through small individual actions or by joining us and raising our voice more politically on important issues like climate change. You know, it's amazing too, Betsy, because as you and John are having your conversation right now, I've gone to the Earthkeepers section of your main website of uh, Timberland.com and, and would really urge our listeners, if you're listening this morning, uh, lingering over a cup of coffee perhaps uh, at your computer or you have a laptop with you, you really need to check the site out and pay particular attention to the Earthkeepers portion of the site or go to Earthkeepers.com. But this is really amazing, showing just the whole process of uh, of birth to rebirth, if you will, of different materials being repurposed and put into these beautiful new footwear products. Cool. Thanks. And I definitely encourage folks to check it out. And, and you mentioned the products, which, of course, is another important way we can communicate to consumers what we're doing. We can give them these great environmental gifts with purchase, shoes that are great performance shoes that look cool, but also contain recycled and organic materials as well as renewable materials as well. So I walk into one of your new LEED certified stores, and I'm looking at the different shoes I want to buy. And so I can compare and contrast which of the shoes are even greener, which one's made out of more recycled material than the others or had less of a carbon footprint? You can. And in fact, you're going to increasingly be able to do that with more and more data because while we have in product-specific impacts only on some of our shoes now. Um, beginning next year, you'll be able to see that on all of our shoes. So in the meantime, you can compare attributes, things like right. recycled content and renewable materials. Next year, for those data geeks that are out there, you'll be <laughs> able to see all the nitty-gritty on our shoes. Wow. That's the stuff that excites me. Hopefully, it'll excite others as well. The, the nitty-gritty. Well, I saw a commercial, a beautiful Timberland commercial on television not so far back that showed X amount of that 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 great-looking shoe was made out of recycled material. I got all excited. Yeah, well, I'm glad to hear you're excited. I think <laughs> something even cooler that we've come out with are shoes that can be pulled apart, disassembled for recycling by Timberland. Oh. So we can recycle the components into new shoes. That is so awesome. So wait a second now, Betsy. So now you're, now you're messaging, this, messaging this to the consumers. How much do the consumers care and when they're comparing your products versus other products that your shoes are greener and your stores are greener explain that and is there any apathy out there that you have to overcome yeah i think in a a tough economy like the one that we've been in consumers are more careful about how they spend their money and so when they make a purchasing decision they're going to look at all the criteria they typically do. Is this a good-looking shoe? Is this shoe high-performing? I think they're also increasingly purchasing with their values. So they want you know, everything equal. If a company and a product brings their environmental values to action, they're more likely to purchase that product or purchase from that company. And I think that's good what point. we're seeing, that's figuring out point. how to communicate that clearly to consumers so the choice is easy is, is, continues to be a challenge. Gotcha. And now Timberland, really from its makings, from its inception, was a green company anyway. And so has is this a great time to be at Timberland doing what you do there because because the, the world is and the world and the marketplace is caught up to sort of what your DNA is anyway? Thanks for saying that. Um, I think it's a great time because there's so much collaboration within our industry to really move the needle on environmental improvement. So it's not just 
one or a couple companies working in the space. It's an entire industry working in a really collaborative way to say, okay, what resources do we need? How can we better communicate to consumers so that we can drive real improvement? Betsy, do other do your behind the scenes? Do your competitors share best practices? And obviously, on the, to the consumers, you you all are competing. But it, to to yourselves, are you sharing best practices and pushing pushing each other to to more great stu- environmental stewardship? We absolutely are. Great, great, great. So, so what are some of the things that are coming up that are that are important to Timberland? Like you said, shoes that can be taken apart. When does that come out? So those shoes, uh, those Timberland shoes, are actually already available in our stores. They're right. part of our Earth Keepers line. Okay. And what's what's in the pipeline that you said that's that's coming? The more more labeling and more the nitty gritty on the labeling. Yeah, so I think more for Timberland, we will continue to do more um, product-specific labeling of environmental impacts on our products. But what's more exciting to me is that we're working with the Outdoor Industry Association and outdoor industry brands on developing a common set of metrics. The idea being that we all work with our suppliers and measure them in a common way so that we can drive real progress. And this summer, um, the outdoor industry group that we work with, it's called the Eco Working Group, will be launching its first phase of metrics for outdoor industry products. And, and what's awesome about it, that is we'll all be able to understand the environmental attributes of our product in a, in a common way. So that's a macro collaboration to, cre- to effectuate even bigger change, you're saying? Exactly, yeah. Wow. So let's, talking about bigger change, you know, we know the, 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 the Copenhagen co- Climate Conference came and went. And, and, you know, if you were to, uh, a lot of people just said big whoopee-doo. I mean, not, did, not a lot really came out of that. We know your, your company has been a thought leader and a change provoker on climate issues. What are you, what's, what's the next steps with regards to climate change and what what do you foresee happening that your company's doing? So I think that there are two things that, that we're focused on now post-Copenhagen. Um, one is making sure that aggressive climate legislation is passed in the U.S. We think that that would be an important signal for real movement on an international deal. And I think the other focus area for us is really raising the consumer voice on this issue, showing that consumers care to buy low-carbon products they care for governments to take action on this issue on their behalf. So raising that consumer voice is another important part of, of our platform. And that's where um, we really uh, rely on social media and social engagement through earthkeeper.com. So, okay, so earthkeeper.com and social and, 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 and consumer voice. Great, great, great points to bring up. How do you listen to your consumers? How is information fed back to you and to your to your colleagues at Timberland so you can respond to them to them and to their needs? Sure, there are a bunch of different ways. I think the coolest way that we have is um, Jeff, our CEO, leads a quarterly call. So, in in um, in the business world, we do a quarterly call for our financial release. That's very standard for a publicly traded company. I think what's really unique about our company and Jeff is that we also have a quarterly call related to corporate social responsibility. And each call has a different focus. We just had a climate focus on our, our last quarterly call. And consumers and NGOs and anybody with a real interest in these issues can get on the call with our CEO and, and ask questions. Wow. And so that's that's one way that the highest level in the company, plus the CSR team, myself included, get wow. get feedback. Um, another way is this earthkeeper.com site. If if folks go on there, they can see we have um, a section called Voices of Challenge, where we ask you know very specific questions of our consumers and stakeholders around thorny issues, things that we haven't figured out, things that we really need help with. Um, we're looking to have a very active dialogue on that site. And consumers can get on there and and um, ask questions, and we respond to them directly. Okay, Betsy. So now the million dollar question, which we ask all great people like you that are in these kind of important positions that run great brands, Twitter, Facebook. Are you? Are, is this part of the initiatives that Timberland is part of? Uh, Timberland is definitely on Twitter and Facebook, and my CEO is the most active tweeter I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> so it's actually hard for me to tweet because he and I like to tweet about the same thing, so I almost um, – uh, you're fighting give it over for, to him. Oh, I, get, I gotcha. So, but you are you are doing it. So, so a couple of you, uh, you, you and your colleagues and your CEO are the ones really tweeting at Timberland. 
Yeah, yep, we really are tweeting. Uh, Jeff is is particularly active. We're also on Facebook uh, regularly as well. Okay, so, so what's those the, are other places to engage. But what's the greatest piece of inspiration that's come back to you? The you know the value of social media. People want to still brands still need to understand the value of social media, as do consumers or, or or people out there that just shrug their shoulders at it. What has what's been the greatest nugget that has come back to you vis a vis Facebook or the social media network? works that you've been able to integrate into your company or take as a form of inspiration? Well, I think all critical feedback we get on the site is, is definitely been inspiration for me. It, it lets me know that there are consumers out there and stakeholders out there that are really paying attention to these issues um, and, that, and that they do care. So uh, any critical feedback we've gotten off the site has been particularly valuable for me during our, our agenda and initiatives. Gotcha, gotcha. And so are you hopeful, and is Timberland hopeful, that climate policy and climate change will start changing in the, in the near future, or will be able to, you'll be able to influence some of that change? We are hopeful. We were really uh, engaged in the House debate over climate, and uh, now that the Senate is heating up again, we, we look forward to participating in that dialogue and showing that there is a strong business case, a strong economic case for seeing climate legislation pass. You know, you talk about LEED certification, and it's an acronym. And, and so if for our listeners out there, the fact that you're making your stores LEED certified, I don't want that just to get uh, easily passed over. What does that mean in terms of actual tangible things that our listeners will understand that you're doing to make your stores greener and, and leaner and better? Well, I encourage them to go in because we actually display how we do this on our walls. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. We, for us, it's mainly using reusable materials that we source locally. So if you go into a Timberland store, pretty much everything that you look at, except for the clothing and footwear, which is beautiful and new, is, is reclaimed materials. And we've simply repurposed them, not reprocessed them, but just repurposed them to become a store fixture. That and the fact that we have incredibly uh, energy-efficient lighting. You, I'd say look up at our lighting, but it would kind of blind you. It's very bright. <laughs> but believe it or not, there are LED bulbs that use about 5 watts of energy, which is way less, about half the amount of a compact fluorescent, if you can believe it. And they wow. last, last about 50,000 hours, which is awesome. It means we don't have to really ever change these things out. So very energy-efficient lighting and reclaimed materials are the big ones. Uh, the things that you might not see as close up is we work with um, the malls that we, that we occupy sure. to establish bike parking, public transportation routes, um, greater access for, um, for smaller vehicles, so preferred parking for hybrid and alternative fuel vehicles. Uh, those are the funner conversations we're having because that creates improvements for other tenants in the building. Right, right. So all are all the new stores that you're building from here on in all lead certified? Is that what's happening? We're all we have certified. We're in the process of certifying our third store. Wow. Um, our third new store, and all of our future stores are going to meet the lead standard. The lead silver standard right. is our target, and we're not going to um, necessarily fill out the paperwork to get all the stores certified. Right. But at least we've gone through the process for our standard design and know that the standard right. meets the certification. Gotcha, gotcha. Hey, let's talk about, let's go back now we're t- and, t- and turn the conversation a little away from the consumer for a second and talk about employees. So what other things internally, you, you're, you have such, you sit in New Hampshire, which is historically a great green environmental state also, and now what other things do you do internally to for the employees to show your gr- green DNA that allows them to show their green DNA and further inspires them and motivates them? Well, I like that we're doing this call the day before Earth Day <laughs> because um, tomorrow over 7,000 folks will be serving with us on Earth Day. So wow. we, um, as a company, uh, go out and serve in our communities on community greening type projects, so trail restoration, tree planting, um, uh, removal of invasive species, beach cleanup, et cetera. We do that around the world. And, um, and enjoy our, this amazing benefit that we have of paid uh, community service time. We get 40 hours of paid community service. So, so that's one example. Uh, next month, we've got Bike to Work Month, where um, we will create a fun little challenge for our employees to, to bike commute. 
And in, in New Hampshire, we do some fun things like uh, courses on how to maintain your bike. We even bring in the local um, Papa Wheelie's bike shop to help our employees tune up their bikes for, for commuting to work by bike over the summer. And, and sort of continues. You know, every month we try to find some, some cool way to keep the engagement going. So every every employee gets forty hours of paid community service. Yeah, that's a huge amazing. luxury, huh? That's uh, that's amazing, and it's also inspirational, and that's great. And do you also incentivize employees for being entrepreneurial and coming up with the concepts that can further green the company or or, or, or green your mission? We do. In fact, every year we have an award called the Cardin Welsh Environmental Award for Excellence. And it's given to an employee or a team of employees that come up with a very innovative and sustainable way to reduce Timberland's environmental footprint. And this past year, we gave it to one of our folks in uh, retail construction. He uh, helped develop all the lead lighting that is now going into our stores around the world. Wow. So uh, and now let's go back to the around the world. Now, you are, uh, you, know, you are the senior manager in terms of environmental stewardship, and it is a, a worldwide position. Do you have to travel a lot to go visit uh, other Timberland locations around the world? I do, absolutely. Um, and increasingly, I'm getting better on how to limit that. I think it's, it's, less, it's not so much travel to visit Timberland facilities. It's more travel uh, to meet with other brands for the oh. type of collaborative work that we do to, to forward our agenda. So that's, that's the rub. Um, it's, those are the most effective meetings that I have. Right, uh, right. But we haven't completely figured out how to do that yet at a distance. So right. while I do do a lot of travel. I tend to, um, they call it trip chain. Right. Or, or I figure out how to get everything on the way out and everything on the way back, sort of like going to the grocery store and figuring out how to fit 15 more errands in while you're there. So I've gotten really good at that, uh, but I haven't eliminated all travel yet. But it so. also, I'm sure it gives you then a unique and important perspective as you travel to different continents around the world and see different cultures and the green DNA of those cultures. And it, it allows you to even be better at what you do. By, ha- by having that travel, you get a, gr- a, a great perspective, I'm sure. For sure. It allows me to be more realistic and also much more creative in how I create tangible resources for our factories that you know are, are under a lot of constraints. You know, Betsy, we're down to the last three or so minutes, and there's a lot of people out there that listen to our show. We get a lot of feedback and emails um, that are young people that are either in college or just getting out of college, and they want to be you. They want to be part of the Green Revolution, and they want to earn their way up to your position. Is there some pearls of wisdom that you could share with our listeners, our young listeners, our entrepreneurial or our green motivated, our green agers out there that want to become the next Betsy Blaisdell? I love that term that you just used. I'm going to have to copy that from you. That's great. Um, My advice would be uh, when they get to college or an MBA program to look up an organization called Net Impact. It's um, uh, an organization that works with business business students in particular um, that have a real passion for CSR. It links them up with other students interested in working on CSR-related projects as well as companies that are trying to push forward a commerce and justice agenda. And I think, you know, my advice for people that want my specific job is take your skills to a company who, a company that shares your environmental values and start off in another business discipline like IT or supply chain or even marketing and develop your skill set there. I think that built, that um, makes you a credible business person and slowly begin to add more and more sustainability-related projects to your job description. Build that over time. Get your experience. And then um, essentially prove yourself so you can make it into a CSR role. It's, it's really hard to go straight into corporate social responsibility because our teams are very small. We act as internal consultants. So when we do look to hire, we look within. We look at those passionate employees who have proved themselves in the business, um, have demonstrated their passion over time, and, and we, we take from that pool versus necessarily going external. Well, Betsy, you know, Mike and I just want to say thank you for your time. We know how busy you are and what a big position you have. We're both honored and humbled by your time today and, and all the information you were able to, to share with our listeners. It's truly inspirational. We ask all our listeners out there to not only purchase Timberland products to support such a great company, but go to their website to 
to learn more about what they're doing, Timberland.com or Earthkeeper.com. Also, as Betsy said, Net Impact for all our green agers out there. Go learn more about Net Impact so you can become the next Betsy Blaisdell. Betsy Blaisdell, you are living proof that green is good. (laughs) You are way too sweet. Thank you so much. This program will be available for downloading in a couple of days from our station's website, Keyword Podcast. Thanks for listening and join us again next week at the same time for another edition of Green is Good. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by the Marketing Masters. The Marketing Masters is a boutique marketing agency offering website development and digital marketing services to small and medium businesses across America. For more information on how they can help you grow your business online, please visit themarketingmasters.com.